everyone. Um, yes, thank you, Representative. I was just about to do that. <laughs> first witness is somebody I've known for years, I think. God, it's been a long time. Larry, come on up. Um, before we start, I just want to let everybody know that all the documents are online, but you have to go to the 2018 special session. That's what the documents are, not in the current session. Thank you. This is a matter of introduction, Dick Sears, Dick Senator Bennington County. Um, and if you state representative from South Burlington. Anthony McLean of Washington County Senate. Kelly Crayalla, representative from Ben Joseph, for representative from Grand Isle. My last day in the job. Well, hopefully it'll be memorable. Sean um, Floyd could not make it due to a family emergency. And I'm Larry Christ, um, the executive director of the Vermont Parent Representation Center. And I would like to say, just for the record, that I am not the person who took Senator Sears' parking. <laughs> so let's just be clear. Uh, You'll find that person. <laughs> good. I, um, I will also comment that I mentioned to Representative Pugh, it was uh, 33 years ago this week that I walked into this building for the first time. And it seems like it was just yesterday. So. Um, first, I want to apologize for having to be here to testify because I am probably the individual in the room who is going to be the skunk of the party. Um, I'm here basically to present the findings of a report which I think most of you or some of you have received copies in the past. It's called Bending the Curve to Improve Our Child Protection System. Um, that report, by way of an introduction, is a 117-page analysis that was nine years in the making, over two years in the writing. Um, it's based on the experiences of this small nonprofit agency that was founded nine years ago with the purpose of assisting parents who were at risk of having their children, particularly very young children, go into state custody. Um, the report is an analysis of that experience, and that experience involved, at this juncture, over 500 families. And I would also add that that experience mirrors the experience of a sister agency, Ken Can Vermont, who has served an additional 500 families during that same period, with much the same results. Um, my fear in this process is that some of you know me, others look at me and say, well, who is this guy who's walking into the room and presenting this analysis as though he really knows something? Uh, first of all, I don't know a lot, but what I think I know, I sometimes know a bit about. But I have a long history in state government. I have a long history in working with programs and, and reforming those programs, as I said, going back some 33 years ago now. But I am only the spokesperson for a process that involved a great many writers and reviewers. This document was peer reviewed by individuals, knowledgeable individuals within Vermont and experts in the arena of child protection from outside of the state as well. It's not a document that comes from one person or even two people. And I would have to give most of the credit for this to my predecessor and co-author Trina Beck who has done a tremendous amount of work in this area and who has forgotten more about child protection than I will ever know. The purpose of my being here today, present an overview of the nine-year analysis, present an overview of the recommendations, and frankly, to urge the legislature to take affirmative action so as to avoid future litigation in this arena. Um, overarching findings from this report. But I want to couch this with just a couple of data points. For the past 12 years at least, uh, our reports of child abuse and neglect have increased by about 1,000 to 1,500 every year. That data is there. At the same time, those of you who sit on this panel are aware, the state's population has not changed. It's remained static. So somehow, Vermont is managing to generate 
1,000 to 1,500 new abuse reports and neglect reports each year with a population that remains almost exactly the same. However, with the increase in reports of child abuse and neglect, our rate of investigations has remained almost exactly the same. And our rate of substantiations has remained almost exactly the same. But the system has been flooded with new cases. And as I think we all know, the courts are backlogged. DCF is awash with cases that usually exceed the national standards for caseloads. But all of that's happened in an arena where Vermont is ranked as one of the best states to live in. And we are one of the most family friendly and healthy states to be in. There is a disconnect someplace in this process. You can't have a static population, but increase rates of abuse and neglect at the same time that you're one of the best places in the country to live in. Those just don't compute. Overarching findings from this report, and I want to be clear, this report doesn't point a finger at anyone. It points fingers at the system as a whole, a system that has existed for several decades now, a system that many of you have struggled with trying to figure out how to make it work in a way that benefits our children and our families and the state as a whole. This is not directed at current administration or previous administrations. There is a great deal of res responsibility that covers a great many people, not any one individual. The first and most important finding of this report is the fact that there is no place in this system where the system is held accountable. No one does. No one is really responsible for the outcomes. The system is broken into categories. We have a child protection agency. We have a prosecu prosecutor's system in the state. We have a judiciary system in the state. But no one is really responsible for the outcomes. Most people aren't even sure what the outcomes are. Current oversight by the administration is virtually non-existent and has been for some time. And oversight by the legislature, pardon me, is ineffective. Because the enormity of the task you're trying to deal with outstrips the resources that you have to monitor the system. The system operates essentially on a basis of trust, but don't verify. And the reason that verification isn't there is because the system operates in almost total confidentiality. And I'll make an analysis. The Chinese built a wall once, a great wall. The goal was to keep the Mongols out. <clears throat> For those of you who are versed in Chinese history, what you realize is the wall didn't keep the Mongols out. It kept the Chinese in. We have a system of confidentiality now where no one can look at the system to see what's going on because everything is confidential. It is virtually impossible to actually review cases. It is impossible to be able to track complaints. And it is impossible to verify what has been done to address situations that are brought to the surface where people say this is a problem. It just is not possible to regulate and monitor a system when you can't look inside of that system. Performance measures focus on process, not outcomes. You will find virtually no real outcomes in any of the systems that we operate with. And in many cases, even process is absent. The veil of confidentiality protects the system, not the people in it. <clears throat> Decision making and interpretation of laws and policies is arbitrary and capricious. Misfeasance, and I'm sorry to say in some cases malfeasance, have become the norm rather than the exception in this system. Individual workers are largely untrained and inadequate to the tasks that they're assigned. Indigent families operate largely without an understanding of the system. They don't understand what their rights are, and there's no place for them to go other than a small nonprofit to find out what those rights are in a timely fashion. And they have no access to clarifying information that is provided in a thorough and neutral manner. Workers in the system, frankly, often operate under exactly the same handicaps. Internal reform 
is precluded by a pervasive culture more reminiscent, and I, I hesitate to use this word, but it is what we have experienced, of Vermont's early eugenics movement. We're not talking about Native Americans, we're not talking about indigenous people, we're talking about poor people at this point. Assigned attorneys, with some exceptions, and I want to be very clear because there are some outstanding assigned attorneys who represent indigent people in this system. But, as a category, assigned attorneys, with few exceptions, fail to adequately represent their clients, leaving parents defenseless in confronting the power of the state. And we have given the state dramatic power in this arena, power that most other agencies never get. In those instances where the system is confronted by competent legal, and this is, this is a key finding, in those instances where the system is confronted by competent legal professionals supported by competent social work professionals, early in the interaction with families in the state, children are typically not removed, and when they are, the removal is reversed in short order. Otherwise, children remain in out-of-home placement for extended periods, families operate in turmoil, backlogs mount, and successful outcomes diminish accordingly. Relative to the system itself and the components of the system, our Child Protection Agency consistently demonstrates an inability or an unwillingness, in some cases both, to fulfill its basic obligation of investigating allegations of abuse and neglect. In three years of doing this job and working with over 150 families in the three-year period, I have yet to see a competent investigative report, not one. The system denies parents due process and reviews and fair hearings by violating state statutes and fair hearing standards. And all one has to do is look at some of the footnotes from the Vermont Supreme Court to see where this has been identified. It operates absent meaningful oversight and without discernible quality assurance or complaint resolution process. If you have a complaint with regard to DCF, there is virtually no place to go where you can be guaranteed that that complaint will be addressed. The system has a pervasive culture of we don't need to investigate allegations. We know these families. And it operates under a veil of confidentiality that serves to protect both misfeasance and malfeasance when that does occur. And I have experienced it in the process of this job. One, but one brief example. Two year olds found to have multiple concussions. Um, the two year old is reported as possibly suffering from abuse and neglect. Through a process, a dual state process, the two-year-old and another child are allowed to leave Vermont, go to another state where they are supposed to be housed, when in fact they're brought to a homeless shelter. No one bothers to find out whether there's actually housing for these folks or not. The parent who resides in Vermont was the subject of a four and a half month investigation in which witness testimony was not truthfully reported by the DCF investigator, and in which a doctor's report was basically turned around. A doctor who said, this does not appear to be non-accidental, was transformed into, this appears to be a non-accidental accident. In effect, after four and a half months of children being spirited away from the state, <coughs> the mother who had taken the children out of state is found to have abused physically the same child again who wound up with additional fractures. In the end, this family in Vermont received a letter saying, we've investigated and we haven't found, we have found that there's been abuse, but we don't know who did it. That's what the letter said. The reality was there was no investigation of significance. Multiple witnesses were offered and not interviewed. One witness was brought back to Vermont from out of state twice for interviews and was never interviewed after multiple meetings with the district office, the district director, and an investigator. That's not an exception. That has become the rule in my experience with this process and our program's experience. Our public defender agency routinely employs private attorneys who, in many cases, never meet their clients. I'm not kidding never meet their clients 
until minutes before a court appearance. It doesn't matter if they have represented them for a month, a year, or two years. They don't return phone calls, they don't return email messages, and they don't know who the clients are. In many cases, what you will find is that families are told to plead to the merits simply because the attorney does not want to have to do the research to verify whether what DCF has said is true is actually true. They don't hold strategy discussions, they don't review documents, they don't develop, develop evidence, and they don't present witnesses. In large part, because they aren't compensated with sufficient resources to do the level of work that they're required to do. The second largest complaint that we receive through our helpline is people calling to say, how do I get my attorney to represent me? And we have a whole litany we go through with people as to what they could do, and it involves sending them certified letters, it involves then sending certified letters to the, to the Office of Defender General, and it involves actually developing their defenses and giving it to the attorneys and saying, please present this in court. In instance after instance, it does not happen. Currently, contract attorneys are provided virtually no supervision. Contrast this to state's attorneys and to attorney, assistant attorney generals who are provided, one, the resources that they need to do their job, two, supervision, three, monitoring, and quality assurance. None of those exist in this contract system. Human nature being what it is, we know what the outcome of that kind of a system is, and we have observed it on a regular basis. And finally, it's not finally, <clears throat> but one example of this is a mother of four young children comes down with the flu, asks the school for assistance. The teacher who was asked files a report with DCF. DCF visits the mother and decides on a visual examination that the mother is using drugs. The mother has documentation from her physician that she's been suffering from a terrible experience with flu. That's not considered. Four children are taken into custody. A minister comes forward to testify on her behalf, the minister's wife, who has cared for these children, as well as a host of other community supports and professionals. The four children are removed because of suspected substance abuse. Those four children have been in four different foster homes in four different towns for three years now and are not allowed to visit one another, the reason being they're too young to bond with one another. That's the process. All of this information was provided to an assigned counsel. None of it was presented in court on this client's behalf. Our state's attorneys and attorney general routinely have to rely on DCF affidavits and testimony that is suspected best and generally goes unchallenged as to its veracity. It's the way the systems work. When the state's attorney receives a police report, they expect that the police have done an investigation, and they expect that there is monitoring on the police side to make sure that happens. There is no way to go back and verify. They don't have the time, they don't have the resources, that the information they're being given is true. The only person who has the opportunity to do that is assigned counsel. And we've just talked about the role that assigned counsel does or doesn't play in this process. Without an adversarial system in place, there is no justice. Our judiciary routinely does not hold hearings within the prescribed 72 hours following an emergency removal. What we have done instead is decided that within the 72 hour period, the judge will set a date for a hearing. Not hold a hearing, set a date for a hearing and the date is always two to three months in advance of that date. Which means <clears throat> there is no testing of whether children should have been removed or not in an emergency hearing. Children will sit in custody, and I would refer to it as custody, they'll sit in foster homes, maybe several foster homes over a period of two to three months before anyone even has an opportunity to say whether they really should have been removed or not. 
the court system routinely rotates judges. Now, we have a rotation process in the state, and there are real reasons for that, where judges generally sit for approximately two years in a given, in a given court. What happens, though, in these cases is that you not only have that rotation, but because of the backlog, you have multiple judges within that rotation who hear cases. It often means that you have a judge sitting on a case who doesn't know what went on before them. I can give you an example of one judge who, <clears throat> who went in a day ahead of time to review the cases that would be coming up, then came into court and realized, looking around the courtroom, there wasn't one person in the courtroom who understood what this case was about. Everyone had changed. The DCF worker had changed multiple times. The state's attorney had changed. In many cases, you can have multiple attorneys representing the parents. There is one client I work with who has had four attorneys assigned through no fault of his own over a two and a half year period, and he's never met number three. But he's working with number four now. It makes it impossible for judges to actually manage cases. They, the information they get is questionable, there is very little contest around that information, and the judges rotate on a regular basis. Additionally, there simply is more work than the court system can manage. And there's more work than it can manage because the prevailing thought is we will take kids into custody and then let the court figure out whether we did the right thing or not as opposed to we will investigate allegations, we'll write reports that can withstand scrutiny, and if those reports contain sufficient information, then we will do what needs to be done to ensure protection of the child. We do this in reverse. We take the kids, then we let people figure out whether we should have or not. The result being that Vermont has the second highest rate of terminating parental rights in the country. And some people will say it shows we do it right and everyone else does it wrong. It is hard to comprehend that that is the defense for this process, especially in light of what we have found with what actually happens in these cases. We have one of, if not the highest rate of child removal in the Northeast. Somehow, there is something in the water, in the air, in this building, who knows what it is, that causes Vermont parents to be worse than all the other parents in New England and most of the other parents in the country. I don't believe that's true. I think what we have is a, a systemic failure, a system that has collapsed upon itself, and the end result is we have children who come into custody who shouldn't be there. I believe we have children who are not brought into custody who should be there. Talk to teachers sometime if you want to see that side of the equation. I don't go any further with that because, quite frankly, parents who are abusing their children don't call us. <laughs> it's parents who are alleged to have abused their children and say we didn't do it. But no one comes forward and volunteers and says, by the way, I'm abusing my children and nobody has come and taken them away. I will also add for the record that our policy is to work with families. It is not always to support families. I can't tell you the number of times I have told parents, I am sorry, but we will not work with you. And the reason is you haven't told me anything that convinces me that ECF made a mistake in what they're doing. Or, quite frankly, you have to make a choice in your life. You either love your kids or you love your boyfriend who is on the abuse registry. You cannot love them both because the state is not going to allow that to happen. And some parents go, well, thank you. I didn't really understand it that way, and other people will use language I won't repeat here and slam the phone down. And that's when I know that DCF did the right thing. Those cases, though, are not the norm. We have a history in this state, quite frankly, of having wildly fluctuating rates of removal and detention of children from district to district. And I can say this with a sense of confidence. We've all heard how terrible Franklin County is with its data, how terrible Franklin County is with the number of kids who are, who are in the process of Chin's action. However, Franklin County doesn't have a greater opioid problem than the rest of the state. Because when you look at the data, their deaths and overdoses aren't any greater. They're in line with the population. Secondly, 
Franklin County and Rutland County have very similar demographics. When you go through a per capita income, when you go through a host of features, those two counties are quite similar. But look at the data as far as chintz cases, termination of parental rights, and children in custody. And there is a dramatic difference between what happens in Franklin County and what happens in Rutland County. And I will say this, in three years of this work, I haven't had one parent complain about Rutland County, not one. We have a history of substantiating abuse and neglect using standards that are far outside of established legal parameters. And I'll give you the bis biggest example. The greatest increase in substantiations has to do with risk of harm. And in many cases, the risk isn't specified, and what the harm is isn't specified either. Risk of harm has de facto become abuse and neglect unto itself. That's not how the statute reads. And it certainly is not in the descriptions that are provided in the statute as to what constitutes risk of harm. But that's what we substantiate for now, risk of harm. I have had families that have been told that hanging their clothes in an indoor line over a wood-burning stove is risk of harm. Having too many pets is risk of harm. Having to walk a mile from the school bus stop to the house is risk of harm. This has really gotten to a point where it doesn't mean anything anymore. It has become totally subjective, yet people are substantiated and substantiated on a regular basis. Our system routinely coerces family into open family service cases, absent any findings of abuse and neglect. Once you come to the attention of DCF, you are going to have an open case. It doesn't matter what an investigation shows or doesn't show. And if it turns out that there is no abuse or neglect, and there really aren't services needed, you are still going to have an open family services case. If you have been a foster child, you have been party to a DCF action with a young child, you have anyone in your family who has had a substance abuse issue, all because you might commit abuse or neglect, not because there's any evidence that you have. And that's the use of a standardized tool that is used as the only reason for opening a case, which is suppo supposed to be a voluntary process. It is not. I use the term coerced because families are routinely told, if you do not agree, we may have to go to court and then take your children into custody. What parent is not going to agree, frankly? Recommendations. And, and let me just add this before I get to recommendations. All of that I have described so far is what we believe has contributed to the monumental backlogs in our system. There is no, there is no control on the spigot of where the cases originate in the first place. And until that is dealt with, all of the reforms on the back end are going to be a waste of time. Because as long as the spigot stays wide open, we're always going to be flooded with cases. Key recommendations. In the report that you have, there are some 60 findings and I think 80 recommendations or 70. I've lost track at this point. I would recommend that if you have not read that report from cover to cover, please take the time to do that. And you will know more about the child protection system writ large than you ever wanted to know. But if I was to identify key recommendations, the first is to establish some oversight capability by a child, a child advocate, or an ombudsman office. Right now, there is no oversight of this system, and I can't think of another governmental system that we can say that about. Replace the current contract system of attorneys with a parent representation program or a division. It can either be a freestanding entity with dedicated staff who are provided the same supports and resources as are the state's attorneys and as are the assistant attorney generals. And it can either be separate or it could be part of the defender general's office. However, it needs to be dedicated staff. It cannot be contract staff because the service that you get from dedicated staff who become experts in this field is dramatically better and is on a much greater par to what you have in the state's attorney's office 
and in the Attorney General's office. Retrain DCF employees at all levels as to the requirements for conducting thorough, competent, and balanced investigations and the laws under which they operate. <clears throat> Retrain the DCF substantiation review officers and the Fair Hearing Human Service Board officers and meet statutory timelines for hearings. You have created in this legislature a requirement that a review of substantiation is to be held within 35 days of a person asking for the review. The wait is now between six and eight months. So if you are an educator and you are in the process of being substantiated and you have to re-up for the next school year, uh-uh. If you're an employee of a human service organization and you've lost your job because of the pending substantiation, you can't work until that is resolved. Six to eight months. That's the operation. The answer when it is questioned why the delay, it's because DCF can't keep up with the number of appeals. That is not a rationale for not following the law. The second piece, and as I referenced the, the Vermont Supreme Court, it has come to light a number of times now that in fact the review and hearing officers are meeting with parents, asking them to defend themselves without a clear sense of what they're being substantiated for, and then holding ex parte communication with DCF to find out what's not really in the record and what haven't they been told before they make their decision. That is not due process. That's a violation of state and federal law. I'm trying to yep, time wise. 30 minutes. Okay. The last piece of this is that given the grievous nature of our findings, it can be assumed that Vermont is vulnerable to litigation involving a systemic violation of individual rights guaranteed at the federal and state levels. This report gives the state an opportunity to get ahead of that process. And I'm gonna close by saying this. We are now at a point where no one can say, I didn't know the system was that bad. No one can say that now. This report is public. Too many people have seen it. And we will all be held eventually accountable for what we do with this information. Thank you. And I thank you for your indulgence. I get you know, one question that pops up is, I agree that confidentiality does prevent real review, but you only get a certain number of cases. You don't hear Correct. The, whatever the number of cases. It's only people that come to your agency to complain. No, that's actually not totally accurate. Okay, how do you our, our clientele have come from a variety of sources. <clears throat> they come from referrals from other professionals, referrals from other agencies, referrals from schools. So they are referrals that are made to us. We also, in the early stages of our pilot projects, receive referrals from DCF workers as well. We receive referrals through our helpline, and we we initiated three pilot projects in which agencies primarily in Franklin and Addison counties made referrals to us. All of those together have been make up a mix. It's not a self-selected group of people. It is a variety of people who have come to us through a variety of sources. And you're right, we don't see every case. We don't pretend to see every case. But when you take our 500 families we've worked with and you match that with Kincan's 500 families, Thousand families can't be the exception. They simply can't. They're an indicator, and they're a bellwether indicator. And a big piece of this is because no one can look at the system. No one can go internally and look at it. And that's what needs to be fixed. If nothing else, at least an external oversight and complaint resolution process. And that would give you the information you need to make the legislative decisions that you need to make. Uh, I'm interested that you said there wasn't any cases out of Rutland complaints from Rutland County since the reason for this committee originally was cases from Rutland County. Uh, Desiree Sheldon and yeah. uh, there was another case in Rutland County. So I'm, you know, that shows some progress. 
it, it's got, it shows something. Um, I don't know, you know how far I'd go with that information, but it does show where there has been a spotlight on a particular yes. district. But we know this throughout the judicial system, whether it's the juvenile, the adult, whatever, there are variances county to county. And a lot depends on the culture of that county, who's you know, the state's attorney, who are the defense attorneys, who are the judges that get there. Um, and I agree with you about a lot of that, but I did need to point out that Rutland County was actually the, you know, the bad poster child at the time. And I'm aware of that, and I've been surprised that it has not come up on my radar screen. Judge? Yes, I wanted to ask you, uh, the thing that keeps occurring to me, uh, not just on basis of your report, but in my own experience, it seems to me that there's just a, a, a lack of resources across the board. There's not enough judicial resource, there's not enough time spent by the attorneys, there's not it. I had a case in which I was the only person in the courtroom who'd read the whole file. The state attorney hadn't read the file, the attorneys hadn't read the file. I was the only one who read the whole file. And that was because of the pressure of the backlog. And this was in Franklin County. Have you costed out what it would take to have adequate resources? Um, we have done some costing, which you will see in that report. Um, many of the, most of the recommendations we have do not have costs associated with them. I understand. It has that. to do That's with practice. I'm asking. However, we have an opportunity, and I'll do this very quickly, an opportunity that is probably, for all of us, with one maybe exception, a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity at this point which is the federal, the federal change with regard to Social Security Act and 4E money. As you know, 4E money is used for foster care. It's also used for prosecutorial care um, or assistance. 4E money is now being made available for the first time for parent defense. And in its wisdom, as they're writing the rules, the feds who are writing the rules are looking at combining that to say it's not only attorneys, it's also social service personnel who will work with those attorneys because what they have found is what we have found in our pilot projects here in Vermont. When you combine attorneys and social service personnel on the front end, kids don't go into custody. So the 4E money is there. I would caution this body. You're the legislature. You do what you, what you think is best. The tendency in my 33 years of being in Vermont is that we will say, ah, there's now federal money available to bolster at least a portion of this system at a 50-50 match. So we will take half of the Defender General's money and put it back in the general fund and match the other half with federal money so it's whole. It is not whole now. So there needs to be a process of looking at how much money are we spending now on the system, which, as you rightly point out, is under-resourced, and what will the 4E money allow us to do in building that system, not holding it the same? Because holding it the same is falling back. Relative to, to the judges, that is a process which in our report we say needs to be looked at. How many judges would you need to bring in to deal with the backlog if, in fact, you had the other pieces in place? Where is an investigative report on each of these cases? My last example to that is you cannot, we cannot have a system where a parent loses their child and after three and a half years a TPR is finally moved forward only to discover that there hasn't been an entry in a case file for three years. But DCF said there has been no progress in this case. They were right, but not for the right reasons. Not one entry in three years, but we're moving toward TPR. Why that winds up going into court? Because nobody checks. The system doesn't work, and it doesn't work for the reasons we've outlined in the report. I don't know if I've answered your question or not. I would just like to, I, I'm very impressed yeah. with your presentation and what you've just said. I just want to point out that even if there were additional judicial resources, there has to be a lot of other resources yes. involved. So we can't just focus on the lack of judicial resources. Right? Although and, I would say that 4E money being used both not just for attorneys but for social service personnel will serve as a release to what is now a pressure cooker. Thank you. So. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, I did, you know, just to, uh, we as legislators get complaints from both sides. 
I've got a complaint from a foster parent right now, a foster family right now, that they don't understand why they can't keep this kid, that the kid, they want to adopt the child, they aren't able to because the father's holding up the system, they're blaming the court, blaming the DCF. So I'm dealing with them, you know. So it, it, it cuts both ways. And, and we as legislators get complaints on both sides, and uh, it's really difficult to I appreciate the report. I appreciate the effort that was put into it. I see a former commissioner, Bill Young, behind you, and I'm assuming that he had something to do with this report. He's just here to keep an eye on me, Senator, okay. uh, to see if I've improved in 33 years. <laughs> Yeah, it's not really a question, but it's maybe it's an observation you probably won't want to respond on, but it seems like the report outlines problems at every level, you know, from yes. the DCF, the judges, the lawyers, whatever, and it's almost like a conspiracy of silence in a sense, like why is this not come forward sooner? Where is this? the whole city, you're saying the whole system is totally broken. I, I think that it has not come forward in whole cloth simply because there are very few agencies that have seen all of the pieces of this. And the best response is the editor of one of the state's leading papers called me and said, we have grappled with these pieces of the puzzle for years. This report finally puts a picture together to show us that it's a systemic failure. It's not just a problem with DCF or just a problem with the courts or just a problem with parents. It is a systemic collapse is what it is. And we have an opportunity to fix it before someone else comes in and makes us fix it, and it costs us a lot of money. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? No, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Representative. How's your constituent down there, the former governor? Is he, is he okay? He's doing great. Just put, a, put an addition on his business, because business is so good for him. And Last text I had from him, he was holding a couple of pigs, baby <laughs> pigs. Thank you for the chance to be here. Um, I appreciate you, you giving me this time here, and I'd just like to share that I think my testimony is going to take about eight minutes. Um, to start, I want to emphasize I'm here to share my own experience working in child protection at different levels for different decades and how that might help contribute to the bigger picture of improving services to Vermont children and families. My experience includes work at the ground level doing direct service to policy level work on the House Human Services Committee. And I note that I am not here to speak for any other individual nor any agency or department within Vermont government. As someone who's worked with children and families for several decades, I add my voice to those who've seen a profound change in the landscape regarding child protection. Looking back to provide a little insight into my experience with children and families, my first work in helping keep children safe was volunteering for a group then called Parents Anonymous and which has since evolved into the present day Prevent Child Abuse Vermont. And not to date myself, but when I took my first training to work with this group, uh, one of the board members of Parents Anonymous joined, and it's the first time I got to meet Joan Hoff, former governor's wife. So it was a little while ago. And she was there as a board member to learn more about what the group did. And it always impressed me to see somebody at that level come in to see what was happening on the ground level. At the time, we were being trained to provide parent education and support groups for parents who felt they needed more to learn about parenting, as well as parents that were referred and mandated by courts. That was a time when the challenge was primarily keeping kids safe from physical and sexual violence. The kind of abject neglect we see as prevalent today was more rare then. And during that time, I first experienced how important modeling from parents is in instilling our ways of parenting or not. A mom in the group I was working with shared that her child's birthday was happening next week. The other parent asked whether she was going to have a large or small birthday party, and her response was, why should I give them a birthday party? Nobody ever gave me one. Well, the therapist who was running the group quickly saw the question behind the statement was really, 
I don't know how to run a birthday party. Can you help me? And that's what the group did. They came together, helped to throw a birthday party for her kid. The first one she'd ever seen. The importance of modeling was highlighted and continues to show up now in what are generational legacies of parents struggling to find out how to parent children. Over approximately the past 10 years, though, the Vermont landscape has changed radically with the effects of addiction adding another significant barrier to parents, being able to safely and effectively parent. Abject neglect is as large a factor as anything, most often the collateral damage from parents were consumed by addiction that even precludes prioritizing the welfare of their own children, even in utero. The number of mothers who continue to use opioids right through pregnancy, resulting in children being born addicted, is alarming. Then these children are needing to be detoxed right from birth at the hospital with a team of specialists who understand neonatology and addiction and withdrawal procedures, all at enormous cost. I see several factors contributing to the changes we see. Generational trauma is a huge part of this. Trauma that leads to generational poverty, homelessness, addiction, incarceration, and other maladies has contributed to now multi-generations of families seemingly embedded in the child protection system. And as our services offer more and more training to educators and service providers in trauma-informed services, I add my voice to the chorus singing the praise of such services and recognizing we need more trauma-informed services. Addiction is the most prevalent problem I see, but as I just mentioned, it's often a mask to cover the other difficulties for individuals and families. And it's the behaviors associated with addiction, not the fact that individuals suffer from the chronic illness of addiction, and that necessitates the removal of children from their parents. With getting, without getting into the specifics of cases, I will say the experiences some children are being put through are unbelievable. And it's a testimony to the spirit in these children that they survive at all. What I primarily want to hold up for your attention is an aspect of, that is in the system that the judge reflected on a little bit, and I want to specify a little bit more. Resources are scarce and getting scarcer. And as we head into the session, first thing we're going to be talking about is budget. And if we hear talk about level funded budgets, it means cuts. The reality that I want to talk about is caseload overload. For those working in the Family Services Division, I hope to shine a little light on caseload overload and the reality that how we count caseloads helps to mask the reality of caseload overload. All too often, family services workers are criticized for not doing enough, not being timely, and for too many details falling through the cracks. I'm not here to debate what's expected of family service workers or their work output. I'm here to point out that caseload overload is the low-hanging fruit for which we can make positive change. My main point is currently we count caseloads by the family. Thus, we can say that a family services worker has 15 families for a caseload, the recommended number. And on the surface, that might not sound like a lot. But here's what it means in real terms. While many of us think of a family as two parents and two children, or a single parent and a child or two, that just isn't so. A more common, complex configuration could be a mom, four children, four fathers for a total of nine people. That means one in the count for family caseloads. And here are some real numbers. 14 families, 49 workers for a three-day per week worker. 17 families, 77 people, for a full-time worker, and 16 families and 64 people for a full-time worker. We count those caseloads as 14, 17, 16, yet we add it all up, it's 190 people. Each of those is served by a family services worker. Each of those is assigned a lawyer from the Defender General's office, a lawyer from the state's attorney general. Each child has a guardian ad litem, and if the child is in custody, because of a judge's emergency care order or in foster care, then you add foster parents to that mix, all of whom are served by, the fam by one family service worker, a worker who has to coordinate services, whether the child is under a CCO or ECO, and has to communicate all that to the parties mentioned above, has to communicate regularly for all the family members, lawyers, GALs, and at least once a month have face-to-face -face meetings. 
Along with that, if a child's in custody, they have to help the fosters get the child into a school or child care setting, make sure financials are taken care of, medical and dental services attended to or therapy, and be available for court appearances. And if judges' conditions, conditions for unit reunification aren't met, they need to move forward legally with coordination of, of a TPR procedure, the termination of parental rights. And if the parent is an active addict, it may require trying to get the parent tested and into treatment, if the parent is interested in getting into treatment. The caveat here being what we're experiencing all across the spectrum is that only about 30% want to get into treatment, and those that do, about 20% are successful in staying clean and sober. So we can have all the treatment slots we want, but we can't force a parent into treatment, even they, when they know one of the consequences of not being in treatment could be losing their children. Adding to those services are organizational parental visitation. If a case aid isn't available, the family service worker has to coordinate and supervise visits, including transporting. In one case, a child had to be transported from their placement in Rutland to Brattleboro, a trip that takes about 90 minutes each way for 90 minute visit with parents. That's three hours in the car for a young child several times a week. That's because of the, the shortage of foster families. Another was providing Vincent, visits for an infant to a parent incarcerated in South Burlington, a two-hour ride each way from Brattleboro. And lastly, another visit entailed four children in four different foster homes. And again, this is not an unusual configuration. And the reason is, there's very few foster homes that can take four children to keep the children in one, one family. These are complex accommodations, further complicated that there are not enough visitation rooms at most of these places, so we have to find places in the community for these visits to happen. That's a quick glimpse into a day in the life of what happens in Child Protective Services. And there are many other things that happen as well. So yes, things fall through the cracks. And caseload overload is most often why these things are falling through the cracks. There have been many reports and suggestions on ways to improve child protection services, and I go back to saying more resources are needed. Nowhere have I seen the suggestions, though, that we need to look at caseload overload. It's a major factor in what is not happening in cases, and it's the low-hanging fruit. I would hope that this committee and the legislative committees of jurisdiction would take a further look into this. Bottom line is, we need more workers. We need more people in the courts. We need more GALs. We need more foster homes. There are things that happen that fall between the cracks, but this is a marathon. And we're running a marathon, not a sprint. And what I would suggest is we're asking our workers to run a marathon wearing only one shoe. Some might not think that's a big deal, but try running even a short distance with one shoe. In closing, I'd like to emphasize caseload overload is real. Caseload overload is a large factor in children and families not getting needed services, and caseload overload deserves further scrutiny so we can get real numbers of people needing services and budget and plan accordingly. Until we change the misguided and ongoing premise that people in state government can continue to do more with less, which is what level funding budget means, our expectations should be not to expect better changes. Until we can address this, it will be extremely difficult to think the system's going to improve. And so I hope as we move forward with this committee and committees of jurisdiction, we can continue to take a look at the resources that are needed. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Any Thank you. Okay. Uh, well, Thank you. Thank right. you. What you remind me of is I worked with delinquent kids and there was less question. You still do. You still do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but there was less question. Um, you know, they were placed wherever they were placed, sometimes in the home, sometimes out of home, whatever. But based upon many factors, but not the least of which was they had committed a delinquent act. Yeah. So there's a different process there. It sounds like that process doesn't really occur. I can remember, but talking about social workers, I can remember I had judges and social workers 
to a combined visit to program. I remember a judge saying, I'm not going to send anybody to a program if I haven't visited myself in all our, our settings. You came and visited me in the courtroom. Yeah. Yeah. I did. You did. Well, I um, can say I visit Depot Street. And, but and but the, the, the point is that we had caseworkers who were required to visit once a month. And it was almost impossible for somebody from Newport to get to Bennington yeah. to visit a child that was placed there. And it's an unrealistic expectation. And so I think even then, that case for overload was real. And, you know, that's a whole day to visit one kid that's yeah. down there with can talk on the phone or whatever. I will say they made contact. It was impossible, personally impossible to visit every month. Yeah. Thank you, Mike. Okay. Thank you. Good time. Uh, Judge Grierson, um, you've been asked to um, lead the effort for the, uh, the group. And I, and I, in my haste, got my documents about your report. Uh, I've got them there. I appreciate it. I know I, they're over in Senate, mine are over in Senate. Do you have documents? For them? I've got a copy if you want to come to your group. Yeah. Oh, I've got it here, Mike. Thank you. Is there an extra? It's this one here. Thank you, Judge. Yes. Um, I think they wanted me to go first, Senator, because... They wanted you to go first because last time you took the front of the truth. Right. It was they the, wanted they, to do I, that again. I think they wanted me to be the Eddie Haskell of the June Ward Cleaver uh, scenario yeah. that you described. But um, to start, uh, for the record, uh, Brian Grierson, Chief Superior Judge, uh, here on behalf, or as one member of the uh, Chins Reform uh, Committee, uh, to speak to the report that's in your hands, um, December 1st, I believe it's dated. And before I get into the details of the report, I know some of you have uh, seen it before. We've talked about it before. I, I just want to uh, emphasize that nobody on this committee, I dare say no one in this room, underestimates the impact of the opiate epidemic on, on the juvenile system as a whole and the CHINS docket in terms of uh, the number of cases filed and the complexity of those cases. This is uh, the complexity of the juvenile cases in Chin's particular, much more, much different and much more difficult than it was when I first came on the bench. And that's due in no small part to the numbers, but also the nature of uh, opiate uh, epidemic. Um, what our report is, um, although we don't all agree on all the details of it, I think collectively we see this report as a, a preliminary report uh, that tries to uh, identify strategies, both long-term and short-term, that we think we hope can make a difference. Um, while each of us, uh, the members of this uh, committee, come to the committee with a different perspective on maybe what the solutions are, I think we all agree on the, on the underlying issues. Um, obviously, child safety is a paramount concern, and the goal is, is through um, parenting um, and engaging parents in safe parenting it would be overall the goals are to prevent cases from coming into the system and where those prevention efforts fail um, we will address the, the, the issues in, in, in the system um, with, with the idea of obviously keeping families out of the system altogether or if not uh, to restore those families if we can do so safely. Um, I think, and I would ask the committee as they're reviewing our report, and to review it or to consider it as a, a preliminary report, um, to remind and review the legislation that brought us here. Uh, it very specifically says that this group, this committee of four, is to review and propose changes to the systems by which CHINS cases are processed and adjudicated. Specifically, Act 11 directs the work group uh, to evaluate successful models uh, used in, our, in other uh, countries, states, or cities. And the proposal shall incorporate innovative approaches to holistic reform and strategies to reduce the need for court intervention. So what we have attempted to do in that report uh, is to outline the areas uh, where we think uh, it can make a difference in the system. And the first three or four sections I'll, I'll touch on 
really speak to uh, what we look as short-term uh, approaches or approaches we'd like to get into very quickly. The first one uh, under Section 1 is universal home welfare system uh, visits. Um, these are not uh, health visits. They're a much broader concept, and there are certainly members of the committee who have had much more experience in this area than I have, but the idea is, again, is to try to identify families and the issues that bring them uh, to the attention of the Department of Children and Families and try to avoid that, that contact. Um, and so the first uh, step would be to embark on a study of the existing uh, programs that are in the state, uh, but also to look outside uh, Vermont to see what other programs uh, are available and have proved effective in this area. Um, it's one certainly that um, we think needs to be explored if we really want to start focusing on prevention and keeping families out of the system. Um, that's not always going to be successful, as we know. Um, and when we come to the system as it exists, the, the next two steps um, really talk about, we think, some changes that we want to start as soon as we can, and we'll be going to the appropriate committees, both policy and appropriations, to seek funding to get this process started, uh, a bidding process um, uh, on, to get a study done of the universal home visiting programs. Number two would be uh, the introduction of the judicial master um, to the to the system, and we what think. Do, what does kin process do, but do not require a judge? What, where would you have? A, I mean, I'm confused by that. I think we're talking. We believe significant pressures on family right in terms of proceedings that are related to kin process. If we can, if we what can. What are those processes that don't require? The ADR, the the um, alternative disputes. In other words, the the more mediation. Yeah, mediation, um, home, uh, family group conferencing, um, to explore areas where it doesn't require uh, the hands-on role of a judge every step of the way, but to direct them. That's where the judicial master could have a, a, a role in that in monitoring uh, that um, that process. Um, and getting families to engage in monitoring their progress uh, through those systems. So there'd be a place for the judicial master, but the idea would be to get it in the hands of uh, people separate and apart from, from a litigation atmosphere, uh, the adversarial atmosphere, and try to resolve cases through that means. So the, those two steps, in some respects, go hand in hand. Uh, the judicial master would have a broader, could have a broader concept um, of being involved in the CHINS process as it exists, and this is an area where I would say there's not 100% agreement by all of the parties what role that person would play, but uh, I believe there's a, there's a role to be played. Uh, you can liken uh, that individual to a case manager, uh, triage these cases, those families that are engaging either in, in um, mediation, substance abuse, mental health counseling, uh, that uh, case, that uh, judicial master could oversee that engagement. And at the same time, um, if the families are not engaging, move those cases out of that process to the, the sitting judge to, to make the major decisions, temporary care orders, merits, and disposition. Uh, so I think there's room uh, for that role uh, to be discussed. Uh, even more, but we think that that's one of the things as a short-term strategy, we'd like to get that process started, both the mediation and the judicial master. Um, the next section speaks to uh, the use of peer navigators, which although new to Vermont, um, is um, been utilized in other states with success, and peer navigators um, essentially are individuals who have been through the system um, and can assist uh, parents that are going through this process understand, uh, I, I don't want to say better, but help them understand the process that they find themselves in. Um, there's no question that coming into a CHINS process for anyone who does not work in it every day, uh, like the attorneys, like the guardians, like the judge, social workers, this is a foreign land. It's, it's, it's almost a foreign language. 
um, that everybody in that courtroom is familiar with except the individuals who are most impacted by it, and that's the parents. So the, the idea behind peer navigation is to have someone to assist them in understanding the process. Um, I had an email the other day from a constituent who was upset that DCF said that they, she couldn't have the children and her boyfriend who was on a sex abuse registry at the same time. It's similar to what Mr. Chris talked about. How the heck does a peer navigator do any more than just say, you know, you got two choices? Um, I, I did, I, you know, I understand what you're saying, but it just seems like to spend nine hundred thousand, I'd rather have spend nine hundred thousand on more judicial masters. Frankly, I mean, a peer navigator is great, but I could have. I told, you know, yeah, DCS has some responsibilities on the sex offender registry for abusing a child. My, my response. I, mean, I don't know how to. What does a peer navigator do to that other than tell her, you know? They they share a desk with the person from the Department of Labor who is now in all of the recovery centers um, helping people get jobs. But <laughs> You're serious? Uh-huh. We're already having people, we're taking people, DOL is um, having individuals in a recovery center, maybe not all of them, it may be a pilot, to help people oh, in no, recovery. I, yeah, but that's not pure now. No, no, I'm just um, no. commenting on the number of resources that we are putting into recovery centers. Right. Right? This is about change. And I have a question probably okay, for well, Karen, um, which is how many of the cases um, are related to um, recovery and other issues? And so is this where we should center um, what is number two um, or, and three, provide early screening and provide early access to services. Wow. You don't have any. And I have to apologize, I have to leave at 2.30, so I'm just getting my question out there so you can answer it and other people can take notes. <laughs> I'll let uh, Karen or Ken answer that question, but to answer your question, Senator, sometimes it's how that message is heard and delivered. In, in, I can tell that person, and I have told individuals, um, if you want those children to be with you, you've got to, you've got to terminate your relationship with him. He cannot be in the house. Sometimes there's a difference between me ordering that and telling them that, than someone who has been through that process and can understand it better. That that's the way I view. Uh, I, I, all I'm, I'm but I understand what your point is. I think my concern, I haven't been convinced that peer navigators are more important than judicial masters, and that I would rather see doubling the judicial masters. And that's, that's, uh, I'm just a member of the and, Senate. And, and, and Senator, I'm just a member of the committee, and as I said earlier, while this is a collective report, there are certainly areas that I feel stronger about than others, well, and I will. I do. Okay. Um, I say. So, Moving on from peer navigators, section five really talks about uh, what we would like to do with all of these areas that I've just described is a pilot uh, in one multiple counties uh, to see if these processes can work and make a difference. And the idea would be to- evaluate programs, but we still have that room. Um, Remember the, the uh, domestic violence ban court project? I did. I do. I do. There were evaluations that showed how successful they were, and they worked very well, and still got rid of them. You know, that, that was a reality of a, a lot of different factors. I realize state attorneys, et cetera, but you know, it's it certainly related to child abuse, et cetera. And we had a program that really worked. I'm familiar with the reports. I'm familiar with the personalities so that ran this program. Is, I'm glad to evaluate the programs. I just hope that if they're successful, we keep So do I. So do I. Section 6. Um, quite frankly, in my view, and only my view, this may be the most difficult uh, concept for the, the committee as a whole to agree upon. 
because it really calls upon us to do something that is extremely difficult, and that is look at ourselves in the mirror and, and, and say, this is my role uh, now. Uh, how could I do my job, my role, differently, and what impact would it have? Um, and, I, you know, Mr. Christ made the point of saying this is the, the first time that this has ever been studied or discussed, and it's not. There, there's reports from 10 or 13 years ago that talk about many of the same issues that he's raised, many of the same areas that we're talking about here. I think the real difference is that with the legislative um, input, you've given us the opportunity to explore some of these concepts and these ideas that have really been talked about for 10 or 12 or 15 years. And I think that's the difference. We have the opportunity to do that. And, and I think we should examine the role of the judiciary. Um, do they need more training? Should they be a specialized docket? Um, look at the role of the state's attorney versus the attorney general. Is there something that could change in that uh, role? And, and look at the, the defender system and the, the idea, the, certainly the idea of children uh, being represented um, by specialized attorneys is not a new one. It's not in this report. It's not um, Mr. Christ's report. It's been discussed a number of times. I think this is the opportunity to look at all of those roles. That's what the legislature, in my view anyway, talked about. Look at the system. Is there a way to change it? So, uh, Does that include geographic bias? It, it might as well. If you're uh, looking at regional. That, that sounds like what Mr. Chris was saying. I, I wasn't sure what he was getting at there. He talked about regional. Um, well, he, he highlighted Rutland and Franklin. Whether it's judges, whether it's state's attorney, whether it's the defense bar, whether it's the case workers, the supervisor, why is Rutland now the one that's doing well? Or is it because we shook up, the department shook up Rutland following the, the, the tragedies down there? I think now, so. What, what, what um, glad for Rutland, um, because when we did our listening tour, if you remember, Complaints about Rutland and Windsor County were huge, and um, when we were without uh, back then. I think his report referred to regionalization to some extent, and I, again, going back to the judicial master, the idea behind what we're proposing is is looking at multiple counties, and I think that's where a master going from one county to another could give the consistency that is sometimes lacking in the system. Uh, to the extent that they play a role in the in the chins docket, so I, I think that's another place where we could uh, reduce that geographic disparity. Um, but I but I think this is an opportunity to take advantage of and look at everyone's roles and decide if there's a better way of doing things. Um, Section seven uh, talks about a listening tour, and that would include both members of the public and also providers within uh, areas throughout the state as to. Uh, what resources are there? Is there a better way to align those resources with the demands? Um, so, Ken, I'm going to ask my question to you. Listening to her on the impact of the opioid crisis, is that the only impact on the family court and the issues? This, this, I, I, my quick reading of this looks like we are only looking at one, one issue that is impacting which is the opioid crisis. And um, that is troublesome to me. And I'm not saying we don't have a crisis, but everything seems to be focused on that. And I'm not, I need to be persuaded that um, that is the only issue that we need to be paying attention to. I, I don't think anyone on this committee would say that that is the but only that's issue. How you're, that, but that's how you are listening to us and the impact of the opioid crisis. The, the peer navigators is to be inserted in the recovery centers. No, so, no, not necessarily in the recovery center. Okay, I, I said that wrong. Maybe I need to reread that portion, but I wouldn't see the peer navigators necessarily in a recovery center. They could be right in the court when these people are. Uh, so, I, but I would say no. That certainly the the influx in filings is clearly driven to a great extent by opiate epidemic, but that is not the only issue. Um, but that's certainly the one that is driving the caseloads 
um, and is a major significant factor in, in, in Chin's cases. Um, that's where we've seen the greatest surge in filings since the opiate epidemic hit. And that's why I think there's a lot in this report to that effect. When we have the data, when I ask for the data tomorrow or the next day, you can ask for the data tomorrow or the next day, and we'll get it to you as soon as we can pull it together. You're basing this on the increases based on the number of all of that, and thank you. Trust and verify. And I believe we have the data to support it. Um, overall, we would need someone, if we ultimately get to that point, to have a project manager oversee all of this, because the four of us um, are not in a position to do that. Um, I'm on the floor representing to thank her for her leadership on this committee over the past four, four years. It's been a pleasure. Without Who would have thought, who would have thought, thought you, that you and I would work together? Oh, we never could get together. We never worked together at all. <laughs> on the other hand, um, I hope once there's a Senate chair of health and welfare um, that the four of us I look forward to working with you again, and I, uh, uh, we'll have another medical marijuana bill for you soon. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Thank you. One thing that I should sure will be in it. That's my overview, unless the committee has a question. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, I think Ken Shafts and Karen Shea are coming together or separately, or you, and Karen doesn't want to be with us anymore. <laughs> yes, we can do it. So let me start, for the record. My name's Ken Schatz, Commissioner of the Department for Children and Families. Hi, and I'm Karen Chan, I'm the Deputy Commissioner for DC and Family Services Division. So I want to start by um, thanking you as members of the legislature. I think you, in creating this work group and asking us to provide this report to you, actually did listen and recognize that we do have a crisis in our child welfare system. And then you did ask us as four stakeholders to try to do our best to come together to look at that system, to try to come forward with transformative ideas, recognizing that this is an extremely complex system, um, challenging system, with a variety of issues uh, that are involved and to do and you asked us to do our best to present ideas to you with some specific dollar amounts uh, to address those issues we've come uh, forward as, as Judge Grierson has described with a package of, of approaches recognizing that uh, this is not a simple situation nor is it a simple solution um, what I would say to you is that uh, just partly in response to um, uh, Representative Pugh, that actually while the opioid epidemic is an incredibly significant factor um, involved in our uh, child welfare system and the rise in the number of cases coming into our system, it is not the only issue. Uh, let me be clear. Homelessness, uh, other barriers in terms of transportation, child care are factors that are very much involved in some of the issues and challenges that some of our families face who come to our attention and into our system. What we've tried to do is come forward with a proposal that really recognizes that we can't just fix the system with little band-aids, that we need to recognize the numbers of, and I agree with the issues regarding resources. You've heard me come to you um, on numerous occasions as a committee with Karen and I showing you data regarding the, the caseloads and workloads of our staff, of the court system, of all the lawyers involved, indicating that we are all overwhelmed. 
but just providing more resources, and we do need more resources to be clear, but just providing that is not the answer. That's why, as Judge Grierson indicated, and, and, and I appreciate the fact that, that the four of us were able to come together to think about and recommend to you, the first approach is to recognize we need to do something to support children and their parents to try to avoid abuse and neglect, avoid coming to the attention of the system in the first place. And that's why we had agreement with respect to this home visit approach um, in terms of uh, looking at how we can address issues upstream as, it, as it's described or early on to try to avoid those problems. And let me be clear, the focus is on the child. The, we need to look at the child's health and issues uh, that the, the family may face that may put the child at risk of abuse. And, this, and, and the home visiting models that will be looked at as part of this process do look at issues regarding homelessness and uh, fragile housing. They look at issues about uh, whether or not there are challenges with respect to that related to poverty and childcare. And that, those kind of, that kind of early on approach, recognizing we have, and you've supported as a legislature, an array of services and programs in our state that are far from perfect, to be sure, but sometimes people need assistance in connecting to them, some of those existing services and programs that are out there. Um, and so uh, with respect to, to uh, those programs, uh, we do think that home visiting is an incredible, uh, significant approach. So I'm not going to go through these uh, programs um, or the proposals in depth. Karen will touch on more of those uh, in terms of specifically how they will benefit the children that we're serving and the families that we're supporting. But we recognize that we need to uh, look at this system as a whole, both in terms of the, the, uh, the, the need to address issues upstream, but also, frankly, as Judge uh, Grierson has indicated, we do have challenges that need some immediate attention in our court system. And I, and I appreciate some of the comments that have been made already with respect to some of those proposals. And I think b b before Karen gets into a more specific descriptions, what, what I want to say to you is legislature initiated this process. I look forward to conversations with you. And, and as we go forward into this next session, to have a dynamic uh, approach to what does work. I look to you as the Child Protective Oversight Committee as the champions. I, I, I hope that you recognize that we do need to make some very significant changes to our system as described in this approach, but you may have a different idea about how best to address this problem. And I just want you to know I, for one, am really interested, willing, and open to hearing those thoughts and conversations about how we can uh, better approach the changes in the system. Um, and so with that, let me sort of turn to Karen to sort of talk a little bit more specifically about the proposals and our thought as far as the, uh, the department is concerned regarding them. Thank you. Um, so just to uh, jump off of what Ken said, you know, there is no doubt that our entire child protection system has, is, has considerable challenges and the fact that um, we have seen a significant caseload increase over the last five years um, has contributed to, to us being where we are now. And uh, when we're thinking about what's needed in our system, it's often very difficult to think about transformative work when you're in the midst of a crisis and really trying to grapple with the cases that are actually already in the pipeline and the kids who are already in need of, of, um, of, of the system to work in a different way so that they can have the best outcomes. But I think that when you really look at what was offered in terms of an opportunity from the, um, the legislation that, that brought the four um, parties together to talk about a path forward, is it really challenged us to look at how do we um, transform the system so that those who actually are in it over the long run have a, a different experience. Um, I, I, in my own mind, I think about it almost as though we're on a... Um, freeway <laughs> and that we need to think about different path different um, exit ramps if you will different strategies that will allow us to have um, to relieve the the pressure and and what I think is so um, holds so much promise about this is that the group has come forward with a number of different ideas that we think over time may uh, may help to alleviate the numbers of, of children and families flowing into the system shorten the length of time that they spend in the system if they have to come in and ultimately uh, influence the number of exits because the three of those different um, different factors ultimately uh, are really uh, are impact your overall caseload the, the numbers coming in how long they stay and how many exit 
So I think that in looking at this um, report, what I felt was most promising is that it actually directly impacts all three of those um, factors. So if, when you look at the, the proposed home visiting, um, I think that holds a great deal of promise because if we can get to families and children sooner and equip those, those parents with information, we can change the experience of those children. Uh, and what we're looking to do is really think about um, giving parents real skills so that they can better uh, interact with their children and meet their needs, which ultimately is what we all want, is for kids to do well in their communities and their families. And there, many times uh, I think we, we forget that positive parenting isn't always intuitive and that many of these parents have, have grown up in, um, in, in situations that were less than positive. And so in some ways, the home visiting really helps to uh, teach them how to engage with their, their infants in a, in a way that they didn't ever benefit from themselves. And it teaches them concepts like serve and return, which again, is, is very basic, and many parents in this room will understand that that's the whole process of looking at your baby and smiling and talking with your baby. But for a lot of the parents we work with, that's not intuitive, and they don't necessarily understand that that impacts the brain development of their child, and, and it impacts uh, the relationship between the parent and child in a way that over time has shown um, positive outcomes. So if we can start to get two parents earlier to help them learn those skills, there's uh, a lot of research that shows that that is a way to stem the tide of cases into the child welfare system. Additionally, it helps that those home visitors can also help parents to, to navigate complex systems. Um, it can help them to uh, access resources that uh, are available within the systems, but that really ch are, sometimes parents are challenged to understand how to get access to. So things like um, uh, housing or, or financial benefits in the community. Um, home visitors, in their process of having a relationship with a parent, can identify those things that are needed and make referrals and, and connections that might otherwise, those opportunities could be missed. Uh, and there's also, I think, uh, the benefit of home visiting is early identification. If there really are problems, if there's um, be patterns of behaviors, uh, substance use disorders, mental health issues, uh, those, those home visitors can identify those things earlier and help make connections to available resources and can uh, get to problems before they become intractable and often um, try to, they would, stem the tide of the case coming towards the child welfare system. Home visiting also normalizes the use of, um, of help. It, it normalizes the, the experience of parents in accessing information because um, in that relationship they, they are able to ask questions and, and gain information in a way that feels safe and less <coughs> intimidating. And so I, I also think that this, none of the members of this group believe that home visiting is gonna be the only answer. But again, it is responsive to addressing the flow of cases in. And I think that in combination with uh, other parts of the proposal, like al alternative dispute resolution, there's um, a potential to have fewer cases coming in. And if they do come in, having them stay for shorter periods of time. I remember when street checkers was an idea that was gonna solve the problem. So this is an unlike that. Back. You, you were there when that street checkers were incorporated into our system. That's a, the precursor to our barge program, balance right, yeah. sort of justice uh, program. Yeah. So it's not unlike that where you would have somebody who could come into a family and help them. Exactly. Um, what yeah. happened to the street checkers in the days? We still have the, the, the barge program, balance and restorative mm -hmm. justice program, mm -hmm. and yeah. those folks do a lot of the work that used to be called street checkers. Right. Just evolved into a larger program, actually, in some respects, I think, an indication of its success. So in moving on to alternative dispute resolution, um, I think that it, it, going back to an earlier testimony, it, I, I would never um, presume that every this time, I'm talking about the alternative dispute resolution oh, first. Oh, okay, I'm sorry, 400,000. Yeah. Going back to earlier testimony from today, uh, it's not unusual for us to hear about um, uh, people that we work with that um, feel misunderstood, feel like we're not um, being fair, feel that their um, their issues are not being taken seriously, and and sometimes we're able to address their concerns through dialogue and through uh, discussion, and other times the relationship becomes very difficult and. And when that relationship becomes difficult, often people become polarized and then 
the staff family services, they end up having fewer options and bring things to court uh, so that uh, others can help make decisions. And, and I think that there are times that alternative dispute resolution could be applied early in a case or before filing that might alleviate the need for the court process entirely. So if you um, think about before the filing of a, of a petition, perhaps there could be a family group conference where families come together with a, a neutral uh, party to try to sort out the issues or some type of mediation. I think that there could be great potential there to have fewer cases flowing into the overburdened system and have, um, again, uh, address those issues earlier, or if they do come into the system, to narrow the issues that um, the, the parties are, are working on. Uh, the judicial master, I think, is, is another approach that I think would be getting at, um, at cases at a different, a different stage. Ultimately, those would already be in the, in the Chin's process, but if we could carve off or create an opportunity for some of the issues that are uh, taking up valuable court time, valuable judicial time, valuable um, uh, attorney time, ultimately we could see a, a, a ease in processing the cases that, needs, that need to be in the formal process and have, um, have people have a different experience in, that, uh, in their life of their case. Going to the issue um, of peer navigators, I think it's, there's no denying that, that the opioid crisis is a factor in the increase in our caseload. Uh, we continue to have um, issues with mental health, homelessness, um, a, a variety of factors that lead families to uh, come to our door. And the idea of peer navigators, the, the, the reason it was written in the report in the way it was, was to try to capitalize on some of the work that is actually happening in recovery centers and, and think about how could we ensure that we're not duplicating services and, and also benefiting from um, some of the, the work that's already been done around identifying uh, uh, different approaches to peer navigation. All of that, we can we maintain flexibility around uh, where to best uh, think about inserting peer navigation. But the idea of peer navigators themselves, um, irrespective of where they end up being placed within the system, is an approach that has been shown to, to have um, great impact in systems. And in our state, I think, is unique in how limited our peer support, peer navigation actually is um, in the child welfare system. People who have lived experience have, have a perspective about being in the system that is really important for parents who are coming into the system to benefit from. They can talk to parents in a different way about why they should engage with services earlier. They can help them understand that um, their fears are valid about being in the system and that they need to think about how they're going to work effectively with DCF or effectively with their service providers to try to address the issues. This is about encouraging engagement early so that we can try to um, address those uh, opportunities for polarization and for people to become disconnected from the process. The listening tour, I, I also attended all nine of the, the meetings several years ago and found them incredibly um, impactful and valuable. I think that hearing from people who have experienced our system is really the only way that you can ever um, truly understand the, uh, the impact that we have and think about how to adjust your processes to meet their needs. And I think that in, in adding it into this report, um, I th it, it creates uh, an opportunity for all of the players in the system to hear from the people that are impacted by our system. And, and also it gives, um, it gives us an opportunity to course correct in our, in our work as we go forward to make sure that we are adjusting as needed. Since the focus should be on the child, I'm wondering if the peer navigator wouldn't be better to be focused on people who have been children in the system so that they can help the other children in that system understand what they're going through. I, I, I'm frustrated by the idea we're going to spend $900,000 on the peer navigating um, with parents and I think the focus has to be on those kids and that are, that are going through a system that is very difficult to understand whether you're two years old or 16 years old. Um, and uh, just suggestion. And 
ultimately, I, I do not disagree with you. I think that um, ultimately the, the needs of kids in the system are best met if their parents can get the support that they need to be but better parents. That, yeah. And that's the, that's the intention. That's a philosophical problem that I have with the whole system. So let me just say, I do appreciate that suggestion about having, um, uh, you know, an approach that recognizes kids who've been through the system, who've now lived through it, could also be very helpful in terms of both uh, providing support for, for new parents and also uh, for, for youth in our system. So I do appreciate that. And I think that, that, as Karen indicated, I think we're also recognizing that part of the growth in our caseload and in the court system are parents of very young children. And so part of what our focus is in terms of trying to keep the focus on children is recognizing that in order to keep children safe, um, we do need to pay attention to the needs of parents also. But, but the support for those people who are taking care of the child while the child is not living with these parents who are going to get bigger aggregators seems to be lacking to me. That's part of the problem. Okay, appreciate that. Anyway, that's just my opinion. I want to back up a little bit. I have not obviously read the report itself, so you may have already answered this question in writing, but where do the home visitors fit into the system? And how do we know which families are going to get home visits? So I do actually appreciate that question. And, and frankly, what we, um, what we did as a, as a work group, we did hear from representatives of the Department of Health and Child Development Division who do have a system of, of home visiting in mind and infrastructure in mind. But as a committee, what we wanted to do uh, was to first, before we landed on utilizing that system, that infrastructure, um, to have a consultant review what we have in Vermont, uh, to compare that to some existing and the best practices uh, and research on home visiting before making a specific proposal. But, but to summarize very quickly, the existing system or infrastructure that that, that we at AHS have been talking about is recognizing, uh, taking advantage of the very positive that we have in Vermont, where something like over 95% of newborns actually do have their pediatric, um, uh, they, they have visits with their pediatricians within the first six months. So, so the idea would be to uh, embed family support workers in pediatric practices, um, and then to have there be referrals to home visiting programs based on the specific need of the family. So that the, some might need a very light touch, uh, but others might need, other families might need more sustained home visiting if there are significant issues of, or challenges with the child uh, or the family's ability to support the child. But that, that, so that's, as you may have heard in other contexts, that's the uh, infrastructure that we've already been talking about and working on within the agency, but before moving forward with that specific one, what the report talks about is first engaging a consultant and then coming forward based on the consultant's report with a specific proposal of, of a model. I also wondering whether, going back to what Larry Chris was talking about, the child care advocate, something, phrase or something like that. So if we have a health care advocate, we have a long-term care request first thing. I'm not saying it's good, I'm not right. saying you know, suggesting it, I'm just wondering if you've thought about that. Absolutely, and there have been conversations over the last few years, and it's interesting that you mentioned that model. Healthcare advocates exist and make sense because there isn't a legal system in place for people who are receiving health care. In fact, in this system, we do have a lot of players, a lot of accountability, specifically in terms of our court system. Um, and so that every case does go through a process of involvement of, obviously, DCF, a state's attorney, uh, a, a guardian ad litem for the child, an attorney for the child, parents' attorneys. Um, and so uh, we do have a substantial level of accountability uh, in our system as it exists now. We have the Supreme Court who hears appeals on a, on a regular basis, a human service board in certain situations that hears appeals of other matters. What I would say to you, if anything, with respect to, I don't believe we need an, another ombudsman to say 
disagree with the attorneys involved or the judges involved or for that matter DCF if in fact we've already been through this process of having a court make decisions in the case. What I do think that might make sense and depends on where we go with this is somebody looking at the system as a whole rather than individual cases. That is that as, as we go forward in looking through your uh, direction to us to come up with a transformative approach to our system. We may want to talk about at some point somebody continuing to look at the system as a whole. Now having said that, we do have committees that, that already do that. The Vermont Citizens Advisory Board, uh, the Supreme Court's uh, Task Force uh, on Children already do that to a certain extent. We may want to talk about something a little different, but my perspective is we actually already have a tremendous number of players looking at the system, but as Judge Grierson indicated, it's not as if we're saying all that's working perfectly. One of the reasons in the report that we do talk about a review of the whole system is to recognize that we also want to take a look at that as a whole. It could be as a result of that report, there might be some, but a, a, a recommendation that would come forward um, that would be a little bit different. Thank you very much. Okay. Look. Marshall? Good afternoon. Um, Marshall Paul from the Office of Defender General. Rather than going, since we've sort of walked through the report a couple times now, rather than going through the report yet another time, um, if it's okay with the committee, what I'd sort of rather do is share, um, rather than sharing our sort of specific interpretation of each one of these items in the report, um, tell you just a little bit more about sort of our approach to what this problem is, what this report's intended to solve. Um, and the way that I would characterize that is that from our perspective, there's really two problems that when you take the charge to the committee and look at how does that break down in practice, um, there's really two problems. One is the number of cases coming into the system and the other is the number of cases that are currently in the system. Um, and Specifically, what I'd say is exactly what I said uh, when we were here a few weeks ago for joint justice oversight, which is that there's been a lot of suggestion about ways to build up, bulk up the system so that it can handle the number of cases that are coming in or arguably could handle the number of cases that are coming in. I don't believe that's actually possible. I don't believe that's possible even if we could hire the attorneys we needed, the judges we needed, the social workers we needed. And then all of the collateral uh, resources that go along with that, court clerks, court security, uh, attorney staff, uh, social services staff, even if we could hire all of those people, we simply wouldn't even have the physical infrastructure to do it. Uh, you know, we ran into that problem when we were addressing you know, one of the first places that the bubble, the, you know, the increase in Chin's filings hit uh, in, a, in a really dramatic way was Franklin County. Uh, and we ran into that problem up there. We, we had the resources. We had the ability to hire more attorneys, to bring in more judges. And we didn't even have the court space to do it. It, it ended up having to take you know, an extra period of time to convert jury rooms in the court space. And that's not something you can do everywhere. And so from our office's perspective, this is you know, at, its, at its core, this is a problem that can only be solved by reducing the number of cases coming in, which really means that this is a prevention problem. And that's why the, um, there are, you know, this report reflects a, an emphasis in some areas on prevention, um, is because without prevention, we can keep doing everything that we can do to try to make cases move faster, to try to uh, hear the cases more effectively, more efficiently, and more accurately but we will never be able to address the backlog of cases. The, uh, the um, you know, as Representative Merwicki described it, I think the, the caseload overload, we'll never be able to address that unless we have a really strong prevention component. When it comes to the, the question of the cases that are in the system now, I, uh, I think that this sort of, because we, you know, recognizing that prevention is a long-term thing, you can't, 
you know, you can't prevent your way out of a problem this year, you can't prevent your way out of a problem in the next few months, um, that that's a long-term thing. And so the question of what are, what are the short-term ways to address not the cases coming in, but the cases that are already in the system. Um, the one that I would want to highlight in there, because I think it's uh, a particularly interesting one, it's one that we've had discussions on since this report was written, and I think come up with even a little bit more refined of a uh, direction, is the idea of using alternative dispute resolution to get some of these cases that could be resolved without the adversarial process of the court system out of the court system. And I think that uh, one of the one of the most interesting solutions to that that's really been proven in a bunch of different locations is using something that's either mediation or family group conferencing, which is a different form of alternative uh, dispute resolution that's designed specifically for child welfare cases um, and actually has a pretty long history. And one of the things that I think is very appealing about it is it's because it has, it's, you know, probably the form of alternative dispute resolution in child welfare cases that has the longest history. It also has been studied um, a lot. The model has been refined a lot. And so there's a real, you, know, you, don't, you don't have to build up something from scratch. There's really been a proven model. There's, you know, trainings are available, so it's very easy to get somebody trained up to, uh, to facilitate a family group conference. And so the idea of providing an opportunity for every case to go to some form of alternative dispute resolution before it, um, you know, before it hits that, before it goes to trial in the, in the CHIN system, and to sort out those cases that can be resolved in other ways, I think is a really important one, um, and really reflects, really reflects, I think, at its core, the, you know, all of the interests that have been represented here today. I mean, we've heard from Larry Chris from the uh, Parent Representation Center, uh, Representative Merwicki from the Social Services side, the Judiciary, uh, the Department for Children and Families, and the, what, what I think is so valuable about the alternative dispute resolution models is that it's a, it's, a, it's a way to address that backlog of cases that doesn't take anything away from anyone. It, it's not, you know, it's not something, you know, there's been discussion about ways to do it by speeding up the process, by creating presumptions within the law that would, you know, uh, eliminate uh, hearings, things like that. It doesn't do anything like that. Instead, it's just about seeing whether or not there is some overlap that between everybody's interests. That rather than focusing in a you know in a particular child welfare case on where there is disagreement and litigating that disagreement to see if there's areas of agreement that can be kind of capitalized on and used to resolve the case in a way that um, doesn't require going through the court system. So that's been our office's approach to this entire process is that you know those are really the two areas that we are interested in pursuing. Um, as others have said, we yeah. don't have you know universal agreement on everything that's contained in this document, and I don't think it's you know I, I think that because this is a document that is still in a process that is still ongoing, we're still having those discussions. Um, you know, it's not going to be productive for us to sort of you know identify and hash out every disagreement that we have here in this uh, committee. But I do think that the important thing is that what this document is a reflection of is sort of our shared commitment to finding solutions to this. And really, it's sort of, uh, you know, it's, it's surprising. And it's, um, you know, I'm, I'm very impressed with the work the committee has done in the sense that we're four people, you know, four organizations that have very different approaches to this work and very different roles within this work. Um, and yet, you know, on those core issues of prevention and finding ways to use uh, alternatives to the adversarial court process to resolve these cases, there's actually been, you know, a lot of agreement. Um, if there's specific questions, I'm happy to answer. Or general um, questions, any I'd like questions? To focus on prevention. I think prevention is, and I, and I think just uh, you know from a 
from a macro scale perspective, one of the things that's really interesting is that's also become a focus at the federal level. There's a, uh, you know, in the past, the guidance that's provided around federal money has not been as focused on prevention as it is now. Um, so it's really, it's not just here that we're seeing prevention as being a really critical part of the child welfare system. That's a, that's, it's, it's a nationwide thing at this point. Thank you. James. Hi. Hi. James Pepper, Department of State's Attorneys and Sheriffs. And um, there's really, at this point, not a lot that we can add. We came to um, the start of these stakeholder meetings with a very similar position that the Defender General's Office just described, that um, adding um, new judges, more court days, more attorneys would help clear backlogs and speed up processes, but that um, ultimately it would be treating symptoms and not root causes, and that we um, <coughs> believed that prevention, avoiding the, chin, the filing of a petition was the most logical place to actually have system-wide reform. Um, we've been convinced that uh, through studying the research um, that home visiting, universal home visiting has worked in other states. It could work in Vermont. We don't want to uh, be too hasty about uh, adopting other states' programs. Um, we really think that bringing in a consultant to look at the unique challenges of our state and um, designing a system, looking at what we have in place already, but ultimately designing a system that um, fits um, Vermont is the correct approach. Um, we, uh, after our last kind of joint justice oversight meeting, we realized that um, we we're kind of ignoring some of the charge in um, that we really need to find ways that cases can be processed and adjudicated uh, more efficiently that have better outcomes. And so that's why we really took a second look, a deeper dive into the idea of alternative dispute resolution. Um, one thing that um, I've been, has kind of been hammered into my head is that people that, um, you know, don't have the high needs, high risk, don't need the heavy touch, um, and that you know there are alternative methods that can, like uh, family group conferencing, like mediation, that are more appropriate for those cases that can kind of help avoid the court days, uh, free, the, free up judges and attorneys to deal with um, the more high risk or high needs cases. You know, that raises a question for me, if you don't mind, and that, that, it's to all of the members of the working group. One of the, you know, I spoke about the program that was based on domestic violence in Bennington and Wyndham counties being successful. And one of the things that made them successful was every, all the cases were heard by one judge. So the family court case, the criminal case, whatever it was, was heard. Is there any thought of having, you know, a focus on the family and the children in that family, all done by one judge, one, you know, whether it's, you know, we heard from Mike, I think, or Larry about a case that, where the mother, where the child had to be transported because the mother was at uh, South Burlington from Brattleboro. Um, you know, all of that, put, it, put the whole thing together. The mother's in jail. Father's trying to take care of three kids. Maybe father's got an opiate problem. The kids are in foster care. How do you put everything together, combine all the processes? Is there any thought to that? I, well, no, I can just say that, that ha we have been talking about that. We have been talking about kind of regional models. And, um, and I think the, one of the impetus behind the reviewing the roles of all roles in the uh, Chin's process was to look at that very issue um, and seeing if there was a way to have dedicated staff. No, I was going to say the exact same thing, but we definitely talked about, and Judge Pearson mentioned in his testimony too, the role and the way we set out the system with respect to the judiciary, and clearly part of the idea of reviewing the whole Chin system includes looking at different models, uh, to, uh, including the issue that you're mentioning, Senator Sears. Uh, you know, it seems to me to make a little sense. I think 
sound like there's a place to look at that. I mean, and that's really what I was talking about, a different way of looking at these cases. And okay. Well, maybe, maybe the judicial master could function I, I think it could make it. That could bring everybody together. It wasn't unusual. It's not unusual to have, you know, various members of the family, and, and in some cases, you know, the extended family involved in, in the system itself in various ways. Um, I think just uh, piggybacking and down on something that Marshall said that mediation um, in Arizona, for instance, is embedded in the Chins process. Um, it's a requirement, um, and it's something that we could certainly, I think, benefit from looking at how Arizona does it and seeing if that makes sense here. Um, but again, you know, the report again. I would just echo something that was said by Judge Pearson. Is a work in progress right now. We're still we're not there. We don't have full agreement, and um, we think that this is going to have to be a multi-year solution. Do, do we, Brynn, do we have some, I mean, the idea was to come back to the Appropriations Committees and the Standing Committees, right, yeah. with, with this report, but the report's still a work in progress. I think there's aspects of it that we would like to move on, um, including, um, bringing in a consultant to help develop a prevention style home visiting process, um, getting judicial masters at least want, you know, some pilots with judicial masters in various counties. There's aspects that I think are ready to be brought to the committees, but. I think what, in our last meeting we talked about putting together EAA on some parts of yeah. what you have in front of you to try to move forward on some parts of it right away. Is there anything else this committee has to do? No. Did you have, I interrupted you from your. I, I think I think I was wrapping up. Thank you very much.